Let me read to you from uh, Philippians 1. And if you remember, Paul is in a Roman jail, mainly because he couldn't stop preaching and talking about Christ. And yet he says these words from his change, chains, I will say. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is, and these words struck me again, my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. This is really what he means by his deliverance, whether it's by life, delivering him from the jail, or by death, delivering him into the hands of God himself. The word expectation hits me, especially when we think of it in terms of Christmas time. If you've ever seen in the eyes of a child, they're looking at a Christmas tree. Or in that one wacky Christmas movie called Christmas Story, which opens with a bunch of kids staring into a toy store, longing to finally one day have that red rifle, rifle BB gun delivered to them. Any of you ever watched that one anymore? It's a little bizarre, but yeah. Uh, the expectations of childhood at Christmas time. And I've told you before, I think I've told you before, I know I've shared it before. I'd always wanted to have a dog. That was my great expectation. But I had almost lost that expectation until one Christmas Eve, the dog was under the tree. And um, greatest Christmas gift I ever received. Expectations can change though, can't they? I had a vocational expectation. I was going to be a teacher the rest of my life. And I know we have some people who are lifelong teachers in this room, which I highly respect. But God had a different plan for me. And after 15 years, he brought me into ministry. And here I've been for probably the last, not in this church necessarily, 27 here come January, and another five and another place, about 32 years of ministry. Um, we all had expectations in the last election. We won't go into that because I don't really want to hear you, but um, <laughs> we have family expectations. Um, we had a great expectation that we'd be together as a family, but my son and granddaughter and daughter-in-law all came down with COVID. So they weren't with us for Thanksgiving. Um, we have ministerial expectations. I really wanted to do Christmas concerts, but God had another plan. Um, one of the things that I've understood about this pandemic is that expectations seem to have been reoriented. Because most expectations come with a sense of hope, don't they? And what I sense now is expectations have more a sense of resignation. <laughs> it's going to be this, it's going to be that. It's people kind of almost despairing, almost, if you will, groaning about their expectations. And you can hear that. In fact, it's not something that is new to the Bible at all, because as Paul wrote from that same jail cell in Rome, to the Romans themselves, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. And that really captures the whole idea of the already and yet and not yet idea of our Christian life, that we have been saved in Christ, but the total redemption of our bodies is yet to come, right? There's a groaning that comes when we believe that we are doomed to stay in the situation we're in. There's a groaning that comes when that situation cannot change. And there's a groaning that comes when we know that it will change, but it just hasn't yet. 
And depending upon the kind of way you're wired and the way you've grown up and how circumstances have hit you, your groaning tends to be kind of your own. But here's, here's what I think is important. If we are groaning knowing that we are having to simply wait and be patient until God delivers us, whether it's in this life <laughs> from COVID or whatever, or just when he finally comes and takes us home. And I hope that that happens long before he takes us individually home, if I can put it that way. But here's what the Lord spoke through Paul. When he actually said those words, my eager expectation and hope that I won't be ashamed, he said before that, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you believe that? I do. I do. I believe there, there is a glory to come. But it's not just a glory that is of the future. It's a glory of now. It's a glory that God can show us a glory that we did not expect in the midst of, in some cases, the worst circumstances. And, and he says it in these words, it is to be assured by the Lord himself. I love that. It is to be revealed. Paul had that, that assurance, that hope, that expectation that came from something he knew to be true. For the creation waits with eager longing, he said, for the revealing of the sons of God. And that means when the world will see that you and I were actually children of God. And how will they know that? Because God's going to take us with him. When Christ comes back, we go, right? We share creation's groaning and hope, for we possess the Spirit as the first fruits of our redemption. And that is also the down payment so that you can be assured that you and I will be together forever. Can you imagine that reunion? Not just to see people within your, your biological family that were believers, but, you know, just be together again with Don Anderson, to be together again with Jim DeYoung. You can put whatever name you want to put into that. But that's going to be a great, great day. That's an expectation you can live with and be assured of. So back to that Philippians passage I read to begin with. Because at the end of that passage where he said, I, he has full courage now as always that Christ will be honored in my body, whether I live or whether I die. And then that's when that very, very familiar verse comes to, to, uh, to light, which is simply, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. They both sound pretty positive, don't they? And that's exactly what the word wants you to feel. The expectation that once you gave your life to Christ, he was yours and, and you were his. And that's my hope tonight is just to help reorient in a sense this idea of expectation. Because when we live in Christ, what, you, what we've said when we said, Lord, my life is yours, come into my heart, rule on the throne of my heart, I am going to follow you. We then say, I have no other expectation than to live a life that's worthy of the gospel, to live as only your spirit would allow me to live. And to also know that every time I fail in that attempt and in that desire, that he says, I forgive. And then he says, keep going. Don't grow weary of trying to be good, if, if you would, right? But Paul, even himself, would admit in Philippians that it was a struggle for him. And I love that struggle because that's for me too. And it's for all of you. If I'm to live in the flesh, which is obviously God's choice to keep me alive, that means fruitful labor for me, he says. Yet, which I shall choose, whether to live or die, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two, but he's honest. He says, my desire is to, to depart and be with Christ. And I will bet that a lot of people in the church, not just this church, but in churches everywhere are at that point right now. I'm done with this. <laughs> I'd rather be with Christ. That would be my choice. And Paul makes that very clear. That's my choice too, right? I want to be with him. But what does he come to the end, to the conclusion? He says this. 
But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. That's where it really hits. Because what makes him want to stay is the church, is other people. As you look around this room, can we look at each other and say, you're the reason I would rather be here on earth than to be in heaven? Because that's what Paul is really saying here. I want to be here for you. Now, we don't all have to have the gifts of Paul. Obviously, he was a tremendous writer, tremendous teacher. He was a tremendous, even though he said he would typify his own words as being weak and all of that. For you and for me, the sense is we have gifts that God has given us, and he's given us those gifts for one another. That's what he gives to build up the church, that we might be one body. And my expectation would be for Grace Baptist Church and for you, especially not just for Christmas time, but as we move into a new year, is that we could try to get our arms around what it means to live for one another. And let that be the courage that we need, the expectation that if God keeps me alive, that's the only reason he's keeping me alive, that I might serve the church. And I'm not saying Grace Baptist Church, although you're sitting here serving the church by singing. I just mean whatever God would have you do to be a part of what he's doing. And what is he doing? He's building his church until, because what he's creating that church to be is a gift for his son, Jesus. Right? That's what he promised he would be. He's putting this together, and, he's going to, and he rewards his son. And when his son went to the cross, he said, Father, I have, I have you know, watched over these people. Now you're going to have to watch over these people. And so this gift that God puts together called the church is the very thing that he wants to be able to say to his son, this is yours. And one day, his son comes back to deliver all of you and to bring you to himself and to welcome you, Scripture says, personally into heaven. Now that makes 2021, whether it is covered in COVID and, and restricted degree, still something that we can say, I'm willing to walk into this. Being very honest, Lord, I'd rather be with you than to have to deal with the circumstance of my life. And yet, Scripture tells us, let's just be met, this is worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he goes on to say a few other things, but I won't take the time to do it tonight. I just want to feel that as we come into a, a season that reminds us how precious and how joyful expectations can be, that you may be feeling tonight some of those, that the edge of that expectation is off for you. And if you are, take heart. Because God is really saying, let your expectation be the same as mine is that I would come to you, that I would take on flesh, simply that I could draw you to myself. That was the only way it was gonna happen. But he did that for every person in this room, which makes every person in this room a gift to the other person as well. So let's, let's grab onto that the best that we can. And hopefully that's what helps us to encourage us to continue to sing. 